No, I missed it. Okay, so basically, right, it's saying WikiLeaks 255 Guantanamo Bay detainees incriminated on the claims of eight inmates. So basically, it's seeming like WikiLeaks has released all this stuff about Guantanamo, and it's coming out that there's been so much confusion in the way they've been dealing with the inmates there, even mm, to the point yeah. where they've got people who are they're holding, not necessarily because they're enemy combatants, but because they think they might get information about this source or that source or that source. And so now there's this whole question of, well, does that change the debate at all? Or yeah. are people just gonna be like, well, yeah, that's why Guantanamo needs to be closed. Or yeah, that's why Guantanamo is important because we get extra intelligence. Well, this goes back to what we were talking about yesterday mm -hmm. because it just, it's that transparency element and seeing yeah. what's actually happening there and seeing there are people from all around the world who aren't necessarily even deemed to be dangerous who are then yeah. released back to their community. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Well, part of the problem is it's like, it's like a culture of, um, mm -hmm. of incarceration, you know what I'm saying? We've gotten so used to locking up Americans and now we're willing to lock up other foreign nationals as well. And my thing is, it's not even that I don't feel like we should be cautious about people who are potentially, you know, dangerous or who want to commit crimes against civilians, but you're just gonna lock up everybody and assume yeah. and forget due process. You know, I think that that's the, the, the biggest win that they've had, that Al Qaeda has had, is having us undermine these same values that everyone thought was core to yeah, the United true. States. Yeah, true. Did you uh, see that some of the guys have actually gone back to Libya and are fighting Gaddafi's forces? You're kidding. And, and the questions of I didn't what, see that. What, is the, what, what is the further information from Guantanamo going to Libya? Mm. And then it's so hard can to get you, information out of there. Wait, right wait, now. wait. So you're I telling mean, me so you we had these guys here? locked up and now they're there fighting yeah. with the support of the NATO forces that we support yeah. against Gaddafi? You know what Jen told me upstairs? I kind of knew this, but I didn't really know this that uh -huh. in the States, if you are an immigrant, let's say you're an illegal alien, yeah. you can obviously we know that people could basically subscribe to the or you know join the army, and then there's a path to citizenship. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I didn't realize that now there's this thing called the Dream Act, which I think we're gonna. Try oh, to the Dream Act is off the hook. Yeah, it's crazy. The Dream. So that I that's gonna be really dope. Yeah. Because they they, could, they had a chance to pass it back in December and they didn't. Mm -hmm. The Senate had a chance to pass it. Because all that political panic. All that poli well, Basically, the Dream Act says that if you get a higher education in this country, even if your parents brought you here illegally, you came under the age of 13, so they're capping it, it's not gonna be forever. But like you can potentially have a path towards citizenship exactly. if you stay that you if want you, to go to college. If you get good grades 15, at 15. age 15, if you yeah. get good grades, you go to school, you go to college, or you join the military, then you give you a path to citizenship. Mm -hmm. They voted no. Yeah. Like, oh no, you know, you could go and die for the country, but you can't but be a citizen. Uh, no, but that's the thing. Most of the people, what is it? Most of the people who have medals of honors are immigrants, not like in recent years, mm -hmm. most medal of honor winners. Jen was You're telling me upstairs. Me. Yeah, she was telling me upstairs, and that's, I hope we talk about that when we get to there. Wow. Yep. All right, let's check our Skype. What's happening? All right, Abdul Rahman, can you hear us? Yeah. Hey, How are you? I'm great, man. Thanks for joining us from Cairo, bro. It's good to have you on. Can you Excellent. see us? Yeah, sure. <laughs> you can see us as well. Okay, so just so you know, we're gonna give an intro. We're gonna talk about a couple of things that our our uh, online audience has been feeding us. Then we're gonna come to you and we're gonna dive right into the issue. We're gonna try to ask you some good and compelling questions. Feel free to express and give us as much context as you can. Okay, inshallah. All right, thanks, thanks bro. Appreciate it. Shukran. Shukran. <laughs> 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 Yeah. And that's the thing, All you know, right. people who are struggling to be citizens in the country, who are really showing that they're going above and beyond, great grades, uh, going to college, you want to encourage that. Yeah. Right? In, in anyone and everyone, so. immigrant or otherwise. You would think so. But the, the problem is it becomes so politicized because then you have to stop using yeah, the scapegoats. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, all our problems are because got, of immigrants. Oh, <laughs> Go I got ahead. too excited. Sorry, tweet that gets me all excited sometimes. <laughs> um, Riyadh, we know that. <laughs> TMI. Riyadh says, uh, you guys actually use the water cooler. Nice. <laughs> well, like, we yeah, were th we were thirsty, yo. Yeah, I'm telling you, the coffee machine's the next step. I don't know I'm when saying, that's gonna happen. No, man, I, we need tea, man. We need more, more green tea, tea, organic tea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for real. So I just had my green tea. It's over now. In fact, I'm gonna. Oh shoot! Shoot! Sugar! Shoot! What's going on then? Okay. Shall we? I don't know how this works. 
I think this is more. One minute, one minute to the show. More All right, we got 60 seconds to air. Did you know, see the more? Did you see the more instantaneous stuff? No, I didn't. The yeah, sit-in sit protests, it's like only like two or three dozen people in Mauritania now protesting. I mean... Oh wait, I did see something in Mauritania. Yeah, yeah it's and, with, and basically... Uh, it works, I can hear you. Basically, I'm in shock, man, because, you know, people think like, okay, how far is this going to go? But yeah. it's reached Mauritania, yeah. Yeah. which, yeah, frankly... See, this is scary. I mean, I want to. This is something I want to talk about. Is like, what happens when it gets to Sub-Saharan Africa? Because I think that people like Mugabe and them, if they yeah. start doing this in Zimbabwe, he'll just kill everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, what about Gaddafi? Same, same difference. Well, that's, but the United, the rest of the world cares because they got oil. They didn't get exactly. Yeah, well. Well, in Zimbabwe, Mugabe people have? are still <laughs> in Zim. People are still standing up and taking photos with their cameras yeah, and showing yeah. the police violence that's occurring. Yeah. That's true. That's brave. Okay. All right, this is gonna be good. Hi, I'm Derek Ashong, and you are now in the stream, a social media community with its own daily TV show. We are bringing you stories that are ongoing, global, and sourced from social media. Today, Web Savvy, the Muslim Brotherhood, pulls out all stops on social media. The Malaysian government is handing out free email addresses, but no one's interested. And tweet about election results in Canada, and you could go to jail. With us for a second day is Mark Belinsky, co-founder of Digital Democracy. Great to have you here, Mark. Also, as always, our digital producer, Ahmed Shiab el -Din. And today, we've got a very special guest. Uh, we're going to play a little bit of her video. Uh, her name is Rana al Khatib. She is a student at Northwestern in Qatar. She's also an intern with us here in the stream, and she's made this amazing film that is called Broken Records. Rana, tell us what Broken Records is all Thank about. Thank you for having me, Derek. Um, so basically, my two girlfriends and I recently made the documentary on Arab hip hop, on the rise of Arab hip hop, called Broken Records, that features beatboxers, breakdancers, rappers from the Middle East. Okay, so people, I mean, this is three young women it, making a film about Arab hip hop. Yes. And I understand you guys have won some accolades for this. Yes, we found out two days ago that we won the second uh, prize for the pro for promising films uh, in the Al Jazeera Film Festival. Congratulations, Thank that's you. wonderful. Rana, we're going to be hearing more from you in a Thank moment. You, Derek. Mark, tell us what's up with digital democracy. So, digital democracy works with grassroots groups around the world, empowering them with free and open source technologies. Uh, enabling them to do what they do that much better and that much faster. That's awesome. Well, we know that a lot of people need tools in order to be able to raise their voices, so the work you guys are doing is really important, and thank you for it. Thank uh, you. Ahmed has been tracking what people have been feeding into the stream. What are people talking about? Well, one of the first comments we got on the actual feed, the stream box, that I wanted to raise with you guys is from Live J, and this is about 21 hours ago. He's talking about a new policy shift in South Korea because they've you know, been facing a lot of pressure to basically crack or crack down or curb on on online gaming because it's an addiction in South Korea. I'm just going to quickly show this website. Basically, the takeaway is that when the system's in effect, those people that are under the age of, of 15 will be banned from playing online games between midnight and 6 a.m. So it's not a complete ban, but they're trying to curb that. Um, another tweet that we got was this video uh, that I retweeted right here. And after I retweeted it out, it's very graphic. It's right here, you can see it. Um, it says tens of peaceful protesters are being killed every day in Syria. We're not going to play the video, but this happened in Dara. Um, what's interesting, I thought, was that someone from Saudi Arabia, Nawara82, sent me a pic basically telling me that she was unable to access the video. She lives in Khobar, uh, in Saudi Arabia. And right here, you'll see, this is essentially what she sent to me, showing that the page is, is blocked. And Saudi Arabia has been blocking uh, many, many pages. You know, sometimes it's about religion, sometimes it's about protests, but also from Bahrain. So if you have any stories um, that you want to share with us, remember you can also use the Tell Al Jazeera hashtag to recommend stories to us, and please keep it coming, because this is all about community, and we really want and need you to be a part of it. Thanks a million, Ahmed, for that. We're going to jump right into our top story. As Egypt prepares for elections later this year, one of its oldest political groups is embracing the power of new technology. The Muslim Brotherhood has launched new websites and is also using Facebook and Twitter to spread its message. Now, here's an interesting graphic that we found 
about social media usage in Egypt online. And we can see that from October of last year up until this month, April, we've seen this massive rise in social media usage in the country. Well, uh, there's been a concurrent rise in the support of the website of the Mo Muslim Brotherhood known as Ikhwan Online. And Ikhwan means brotherhood, I believe, in Arabic. And basically, you can see that they've also seen significant interest in what they've been doing. Well, we're happy to have joining us now a blogger and political activist, Abdurrahman Ayash, who is from Cairo. Uh, Abdurrahman, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, sir. Now, Abdurrahman, tell us a little bit about your own work. We understand that you are a member of the Muslim Brotherhood and that you are actually uh, one of the curators of one of their websites. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. I've worked before for ikhwanweb.com, the official English website of the Brotherhood. And now I'm running one of the Muslim Brotherhood websites called ikhwanophobia.com. Okay, and ikhwanophobia is specifically focused on combating rumors and misconceptions about the Muslim Brotherhood. What would you say is one of the most uh, preeminent misconceptions, the biggest misunderstandings about the Muslim Brotherhood? Yeah, the main misconception may be that the Muslim Brotherhood is a terrorist group or a very extremist group that want to um, get over the authority or the power in Egypt here uh, be, um, by violence or uh, violence phase. But this is not true at all. The Muslim Brotherhood, through their long history in Egypt, they, they, they haven't committed any uh, violent actions against the authority or against any minorities or against any Egyptian people. And uh, on the other hand, if any one of the Muslim Brotherhood did anything wrong about that, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood um, yeah, did a lot of um, what we can call... Um, yeah, they, they were, you know, Basically, you're saying uh, that you actually you're you're taking action against members of your organization who may have committed any kind of offenses to society. You know, we want to hold you right there, Abdul Rahman, because Ahmed has got some really interesting images that we saw about, uh, you know, not only from your website, but also I know that you saw some things about Egypt in the past. Yeah. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the cultural shift that's happened. Yeah, uh, Abdul Rahman, I'm sure you know, I, I grew up in Egypt for about nine to ten years, and I remember this was in the 90s, the early 90s, the late 80s, and, and Egypt was a very different place, and obviously it's going through change right now. Let me just quickly pull up the pictures. This is Egypt in the 30s and the 60s and the 50s. This photo is actually 1959. Um, right here, this is 1931. These are Egyptian women and men. Right here, this is, uh, you know, in Alexandria, Alexandria, you see men and women together congregating. That's not to say that doesn't happen now, but we just thought the contrast is interesting because there's clearly a shift that's taking place socially. And I just, Abdurrahman, maybe you want to quickly speak to uh, how the Muslim Brotherhood's trying to tap into that shift by perhaps appealing to a younger democratic or, you know, people who are accustomed to technology. Yeah, I really think that this chat is not about the Muslim Brotherhood aspect. It's all. Of, it's about all the Islamists, or about the, the what what we can call the Islamic Renaissance in the Middle East. Uh, the, the rise of hijab or the face veil in Egypt raised a lot through uh, the last decades. And this is not only about the Muslim Brotherhood. But what we can say here that the Muslim Brotherhood affected or will affect in, in the coming period, socially of course, and I, I believe on the political. Uh, on the political um, way, because the Muslim Brotherhood now is doing their best to uh, to adopt a new ideology or a new ways uh, to to be in the, or to be presented in the Egyptian uh, society. Now, Abdul Rahman, I want to bring I want to bring Rana into this conversation as well, because Rana, you just showed us that wonderful clip of the film that you made. You're a young woman. You live in the Arab world. You're of Palestinian descent. You know, what is your sentiment and the sentiment among your friends about what's happening with these revolutions? And do you feel, you know, there's concerns by some Westerners have expressed that groups like the Muslim Brotherhood may be interested in imposing more uh, strict Islamic law. How do your friends see this sort of thing? And, and then we'll get Abdul Rahman back yeah. into it. It's interesting. Like, throughout the revolutions, we see how women have played a huge role. And, like, you feel like not only are they fighting against the regime or against the government, they're also fighting for their own rights to like speak up and just for women's rights in general. So I feel like when I was looking up Islamophobia and um, about the Ikhwans, a lot of people were against it and people were saying things like they were never with you guys, they never really wanted to support you guys and now you're all with them. But I feel like everyone 
I have different views about it too. So, so it's like there's an ongoing dialogue. Mm -hmm. Now, Mark, I want to point out something that Ahmed has got on his screen. This poll says that most Egyptian wants, Egyptians want the Quran as a source of laws. Mark, a lot of people here in the United States have been expressing this concern and consternation about what will happen with Islam and the rise of Islamism or groups like the Muslim Brotherhood in the West. If most uh, Egyptians want the Quran as a source of laws, who are Westerners or people like in the United States or Europe to say that that's something bad? Well, I think this is so interesting. There's been so much discussion about Egyptians want this, Egyptians want that, and we haven't been hearing from Egyptians themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, my curiosity is, is this act by the Muslim Brotherhood actually an act of them trying to become more democratic, mm -hmm. more participatory, and saying, hear the voices mm -hmm. from the people of what we want to see tangibly happen in our society, in our community. So, so let's go back to you with this, Abdul Rahman. Like, you know, question. You're coming in as a political organization, but there's obviously a social aspect of what you do because your organization is avowedly one that is religious in its nature. If you were to find the Muslim Brotherhood taking a more leadership role in Egyptian society, what would be changing for the Egyptian people? What would you want to see different? I don't think that there will be a lot of changes in the Egyptian people. Because now the Muslim Brotherhood believe in the peace, in the change, and the, uh, in what we, uh, you, you can say, the, the long uh, or uh, the change on, on the long run. And I don't think that the Muslim Brotherhood will force uh, the Egyptian people to do anything or to choose any uh, of the Muslim Brotherhood's choice. This is the first thing. O on the other hand, you can, we can say that the Muslim Brotherhood or the Quranic law is, uh, is, is just about laws. It's all about the, the standards of life. So we can't. Uh, force people or we can't apply the Islamic laws without applying the Islamic standards of life, which, which will guarantee equality and freedom and justice for, the, for all the people here in Egypt. And uh, yeah, other, uh, I think Ahmed has got some thoughts. Yeah, Abdul Rahman, I just wanted to say, you say for all people, it'd be really interesting to see how the Muslim Brotherhood really incorporates the role of women in society. And I think Rana you know, was speaking a bit about that and having them included. I, I wanted to also talk about just the the, po the policy implications, because I see here we also have a poll, I think by the Pew Research Center, that's saying over half of Egypt wants an end to the Israeli peace treaty of 1979. What's your take on that? Yeah, for me, I don't think that the Muslim Brotherhood will want Egypt to be on war with any other country. Now we can't be on war with Israel, for example, but of course we won't be silent against the, accus or against the violation, against the human rights in Palestine. Uh, for me, I, I believe in, in, in the Turkish rule as a, mod, a rule model for me. And I think that the Muslim Brotherhood will try to make Egypt like Turkey in that way. They, they will try to play a very important role in, um, in putting pressure on Israel to stop their violations against human rights in, in Palestine. And you also, of course, won't, um, won't put Egypt on war or won't put Egyptian people uh, on war with other uh, people. So Rana, I mean, the argument he's making seems very, um, you know, mellow, and it seems to be moderate. But I think that a concern that a lot of people are raising is, well, it's easy to be moderate. We see politicians do it around the globe, whether they're affiliated with religion or not. They say what people want to hear. They get in, they do something different. Mm -hmm. What's your take? Do you feel, as a young woman in the Arab world, that organizations like the Muslim Brotherhood are seeing and are part of this new revolution, or do you think that there are potential uh, concerns? Um. As a, as a girl, I feel like, and as a Muslim, I know that in the Middle East it's just harder because of culture, religion, and all that, especially with Islam Brotherhood. I feel like they could talk and stuff, but a lot of girls still don't get their rights, or women still don't get their rights at the very end of the day. But still, I think with the revolution, things have been changing, and people mm -hmm. have been talking and people have been standing up for who they are. So there is hope. Abdul Rahman, I want to thank you so much for joining us, for giving us some more information about what you guys are doing. Uh, your website is, is uh, uh, ikhwanophobia, I believe, dot com. And, and thank you for dispelling some of the myths and giving us some of your direct perspective. We're going to move on and, and uh, wish you uh, good luck in Cairo as you guys build a new society together. Thank you. You know, this is some really fascinating stuff, and we're going to definitely keep our fingers on the pulse of this, and particularly the issue of whether or not, I think that's the bellwether. If they include women, you see there's real change. If not, I, I'm not so sure. And minorities. And minorities, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, we're looking all the time for your take on these stories, so please keep the tweets coming to at AJStream. I'm Tori Munthi. I run and founded Demotics, and I'm in the stream.
Now, if you want to join us here in the stream, upload a video of yourself, just like what you saw from Turi here. Upload it to YouTube, tell us your name, tell us something about yourself, and end it with, and I'm in the stream. Remember to keep it short. If it's too long, we can't air it. But once you send it to us, share the link via Facebook or Twitter, or you can just go to stream.aljazeera.com and feed the stream. Now, governments rarely give out anything for free, but Malaysia's prime minister has announced that every citizen over 18 is eligible for a free email address. But so far, no one's buying. This shows something that really tripped me out. Um, basically, Malaysia is saying that they have got this program. They want to give people a free email address, mm -hmm. and it's caused a ton of controversy. I know that there was a website that was launched against it. Uh, and, and they got like 24,000 Facebook followers mm -hmm. in the space of 24 hours. I want to dive into this conversation, but first, we had a chance to speak with a popular Malaysian blogger by the name of Patrick Thiel about the government's plans, and this is what he had to say. I suppose to answer the question, what, Malays what do Malaysians think about this e free email thing is, the answer is, we don't think very much of it because of the various contradicting statements and announcements that have been coming out from from the government. All right, so this is his take. He's basically saying that people don't feel uh, anything really too good about it. And so we want to kind of get uh, an understanding of what's going on. Ahmed, do you have anything online that can give us some more context about this? Yeah, there seems to be a Facebook group with uh, 50,000 essentially members that are basically saying we don't want this. And a lot of the reasons people are citing, they think there's other social services that are lacking. Uh, we actually just had a tweet that came in, I'm going to pull it up, uh, from Sayyid Ahmed Zaman that's saying Malaysians think that this is not necessary, that the poll uh, you know, that's made we want free Wi-Fi instead, perhaps, or, or, you know, instead of email. And they're basically saying the Internet's quite expensive here. There's also been, you know, government representatives that are saying, why don't we do voter registration dives and other things? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because the first thing that comes to my mind is why would the government want to give you an email address? What do they want in response? Right. What do you think, Mark? You know, I think it's really potentially exciting saying the government's thinking about government 2.0. How do we react with our people? How do we disseminate emergency information? But that's not the message that's coming across, and that's not the way to do it. It's yeah. really to engage and say, okay, we're going to give people access and give them a, a means to really contribute meaningfully in society. Yeah, and it seems like Malaysians are actually quite wired, right? Ahmed? Right. Well, yeah, apparently Malaysians you know, are leading the way in terms of paying their bills online. So you would think, okay, maybe the government's trying to use that as a justification for this new program or service. But in reality, it's a privately funded, publicly public service. So that always raises <laughs> questions. As of 2010, it's 65% internet penetration. Uh -huh. Right. Rana, would you like a government email address? <laughs> <laughs> I would love, love one. When I was looking at this, the tweets were so funny because everyone was like, we can get a free email anyway. We don't uh -huh. need this. You guys can go give this money to people who actually need it. Well, there yeah. you go. And I see Ahmed has got this cool graphic up there. What is this? Malaysia is ranked number 28 in internet penetration? Yeah, what? basically it's there's 16 million uh, internet users as of 2010 in Malaysia. So it seems like, you know, perhaps there's a lot of people who could potentially have accounts, but whether they want it or not, whether it's an invasion of privacy is yet to be determined. Okay, so we're going to keep seeing what's up with this particular story. If you've got one to share with us, tweet us at the hashtag Tell Al Jazeera. Hi, I'm Adam Lai. I founded Visualizing.org and I'm in the stream. Now, our next story was suggested to us on Twitter by at Eliza Talks and it's about the upcoming Canadian elections this Monday, May 2nd. If you live in Canada, and you decide to tweet about results on election night, you can end up paying huge fines or even go to jail. This is the kind of thing that completely blew my mind. We all think about Canada as this free place. They got maple syrup, flowing healthcare for everybody. <laughs> it's all good. And then we come to find out that they'll put you in prison for potentially tweeting election results. We want to get some more information about this. So joining us in the stream today is Alexandra Samuel. She's from Vancouver. She started a website called tweettheresults.ca. Alexandra, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, so uh, this to us as outsiders sounds like censorship. I mean, what what's going on in Canada? Why is the government doing this? Well, you know, you need to put it in the broader context of Canadian politics. And, you know, we have as the United States does, uh, a, you know, a country that spans a number of time zones, and that's been an issue in a, in a variety of ways over the years. 
But up until this election, we've also had a relatively small and concentrated media that, frankly, plays by the rules more than I think American media outlets typically do. And so it's been relatively easy up until now to ask um, and in fact, require by law that media outlets refrain from publishing results nationally until the polls close here in British Columbia, which is you know four four hours later than they close in the eastern part of the country. Uh, of course, in the era of, of social media, it's a lot harder to control that kind of information being disseminated. So the government is trying to make sure that the results, the actual election, is not impacted by people in the western part of the country hearing early results on the eastern side and maybe deciding, oh, they're not going to go vote or oh, they're going to do this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mark, it sounds like they've got a great uh, spirit behind it. They want to promote democracy, but it seems highly undemocratic to me. Yeah, I don't buy it. We have worked with grassroots groups around the world on election monitoring, and it's hugely important to make sure that there's not corruption, to give people a sense that they have voice, to redefine democracy not just as the act of voting, but as everything that goes along with it and having that citizen's eye on things. And there's no correlation between Twitter and elections just yet. Um, we see uh, Christine O'Donnell, she uh, had more Twitter followers, but that didn't mean that she was going to win. You're talking about Christine O'Donnell, she was a Senate candidate from Delaware in the United States exactly. and she lost. Uh, despite being a, becoming a bit of a celebrity. People are talking about this all over Canada. Yeah, and they're not just talking about this all over Canada. I mean, honestly, it's worth seeing this trends map that shows you, I mean, people are talking about this in Canada, in the U.S., in South America, in Europe, even in the Middle East, even though there's a lot going on in the Middle East. And one American in particular, um, Jay Rosen, who's a professor at, at NYU, it, it basically tweeted, so is anyone in Canada organizing a mass tweet-in to protest the absurd ban on election night tweeting? Have you heard of this at all in Canada? Well, you know, it's funny. Jay's, uh, Jay's tweet is actually what tipped me off to the issue. And I ended up in an email exchange with a colleague of mine, Darren Barefoot, who basically dared a group of our friends, you know, who can, who can come up with a website to aggregate the results um, and, and to aggregate the hashtag that was already in use at that point, tweet the results, um, had, been, had been used starting last week by people who ha either were wanting to talk about the ban or planning to contravene the ban on election night. So I, I threw that website together with Darren last week just so we would have an organized place where people could see this conversation unfolding because it's an important issue. I mean, as you point out, Mark, you know, there are real stakes here for democracy. And I think it's important that Canadians not only um, reflexively uphold the, the law as we are somewhat want to do. That's the Canadian character. We're very law abiding, yeah. but actually think realistically about whether this law is even enforceable or meaningful in an era of, of Facebook and Twitter. Now, a quick question for you, Alexander, like, are you putting yourself in potential uh, harm's way? Uh, could you not be found liable for those fines and potentially face jail time for aggregating that content in contradiction to the law? Well, I mean, there's, there's a couple of questions there. First of all, I'm not a lawyer and I haven't sought legal counsel. Um, and elections Canada... Which means that we might hear that you're in jail next week. That's basically what you're telling <laughs> well, us. Well, they say up to five years. <laughs> Let me put it this way. I turn 40 next week, so if I spend my 40th birthday in jail, I'm going to be seriously disappointed. No <laughs> doubt. Um, but that's not my expectation. I mean, first of all, what you see on tweettheresults.ca is no different from what you would see if you went to search.twitter.com and looked at everybody who was using the hashtag tweettheresults. So uh, if I'm in jail, I want to see... Um, I have Williams in there with me. You're going to have um, a lot of friends there in jail with yeah. you. So, Rana, I mean, this is a really interesting story because you're seeing, we think about Canada, freedom, freedom, freedom. We're all talking about these uprisings happening in the Middle East, but people in the Western world are also advocating and daily fighting for their freedom. What do you think about this whole thing? I think it's so interesting. Like, every single time I go through the news, it's like there's a big thing happening in the Middle East, but then in Canada and in so many different parts of the world. It's just so interesting to look at that. One of our production team, uh, you know, or actually two people on our production team are actually Canadian, but they're living here in the U.S. And I yeah. think one question that I was thinking and that they were wondering, but one of our audience uh, members here, LM Oliva underscore, is saying... Can you bring, make that bigger? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Sorry it? about that. Let me just blow this up. But basically, he's wondering, his question is, what if Canadians tweet about the election outside of Canadian territory? Can you answer that? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not in a position to, um, to speak to how Elections Canada is or isn't going to enforce the law. They have specifically said that they will only respond to complaints. So I think the question is, you know, if somebody in Canada files a complaint against a Canadian living abroad, I think yeah. it will be an interesting question. Um, 
I can't imagine who would do that. Honestly, I think that this is where Americans are going to come in. Because just because they've said don't do this, yeah. I can imagine a lot of Americans yeah. are going to yeah. be tweeting like crazy. I know if I see something that says tweet the results, I'm probably going to RT. Well, well people, how is this going to implicate any information aggregator, Facebook, Google? How are they going it, to have to censor themselves? Well, exactly. you know, speaking of Google, like in Egypt during the, during the revolution, they essentially set up speak to tweet because there was censorship, yes. so to speak. Exactly. So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how is that going to play out this time? Well, I got to tell you, the, the big lesson I'm taking from this is that you can never take freedom for granted no matter where you are. Mm-hmm. Alexandra, we are wishing you luck. We're wishing you a happy yeah. week before your birthday. And we hope you do not spend it in prison. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Rana. As always, Ahmed. And thank you for joining us in the stream. Our community is wonderful. We need your input. Hit us at stream.aljazeera.com to feed the stream. Check us out on Facebook and Twitter as well. We'll see you here same time tomorrow.